Welcome to Oyate Today. Oyate in Lakota means people. Brought to you by Native Sun News Today. Hi, welcome to Oyate Today. I am your host, Richie Richards. Oyate Today is produced by Tim and Jackie Gallego. Tim is an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Our guest tonight, while well, our very special guest tonight, is Representative Tamara St. John of District 1 here in South Dakota. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. It's I've been a big fan for a long time. Hey, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And, and I'm uh, a big fan of yours as well, so thank you so much. Um, Representative, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe some, some background information about sure. your life and such. Sure. Um, I am a member of the Sisseton Wapaton Oyate, um, or the Sisseton Wapaton Sioux Tribe, and I am an archivist, historian, I am the curator of their collections. I work with historic preservation, and most people know me as a historian and somebody that has worked with cultural resource protection for many years. I think I've first been known as a native genealogist. So I meet a lot of people that have uh, uh, worked with me before or I've uh, done family history for them. Sure, and, and where'd you grow up then? Where'd you kind I grew of... up in Sisseton on the Lake Travers Reservation. I'm a part of a district called Tokanua, which is uh, Enemy Swim, so a little shout out for nice. God's country. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome, that's awesome. And so how did you, well, when did you first decide to run for for a, 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 a the House of Representatives? How did that begin? How, how that, did that evolve? Yeah, how did that evolve? Actually, um, I had begun to work with tribal government in um, the capacity as far as. Um, uh, judicial committee, I worked with our tax committee, um, various levels, and uh, as somebody that works with historic preservation, I'm an advocate for consultation, mm -hmm. and uh, on the federal level as well as on the state level, and so sort of following that line and watching where uh, we as tribal people are connecting, or where is our voice heard, or where are we receiving information and how, and uh, even more, you know, how is that mandated? Mm -hmm. um, in in various ways so looking at some of those things and seeing sort of a deficit or where we're not always engaged on uh, the state level I remember a conversation that I had with uh, then uh, Secretary of Tribal Relations um, Mr. Uh, Lapointe mm -hmm. uh, Laplante mm -hmm. I'm sorry J.R. Laplante and uh, he had encouraged me to encourage others to get involved on a state level on different committees and boards and to start to really engage and I saw a need for that and so some friends of mine we started to try to find somebody that maybe would and would be a good candidate um, for years I started to watch the politics within my district mm -hmm. and to I saw different tribal people um, run and uh, it, it, it us not having uh, native representation or a native voice on the state level had been a huge concern to a number of us and uh, that's really what wound up in the decision being if I maybe it's supposed to be me sure, sure. <laughs> if you you know not finding somebody else that was willing to to do that and um, I contacted some other folks that I know and asked them you know what do you think I mean how can um, can I win? That was a big, a sure. big uh, yep. question too. Yep. And so, did your friends kind of at that point encourage you, push you then? And yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They had, um, you know, I'm, I'm really entering into politics from a unique perspective, mm -hmm. and uh, that's usually the number one question that people ask me in a lot of interviews is. Um, you know, those are things that we don't hear real often, a Native American legislator Republican. Mm -hmm. And so entering from the conservative side of things was really very beneficial to me. I had actually a registered Republican at the age of 23. Mm -hmm. And um, it really, as somebody, and this is the historian in me speaking, I watched um, the political climate that led up to the uh, self-determination, self-government. 
um, some of the relationships, uh, some of the most important legislation had been passed by the Republican Party at the time, and uh, it, it was very impacting to me. I also am somebody that um, shies away from the sort of uh, stereotype mm -hmm. of us as being uh, incapable as tribes and needing governmental um, uh, management and, and things of that sort. So uh, very pro-sovereignty uh, as far as self-determination, self-government. And so with some of those things leading into the election and wanting to run, you know, as conservative in a blue district, historically blue district, um, the questions really were, were, would I be supported? Mm -hmm. And um, as somebody that, you know, I'm not a politician, I'm a historian, mm -hmm. I'm a very nerdy history librarian, you know, type. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so leading into the election, um, I found that I did not have uh, a primary. There was no primary because, um, you know, as tribal folks, we always vote um, with the, the Democrat Party, in my district anyway. Sure. So in the end, I wound up wondering, you know, all I could do was to campaign hard, um, you know, get out there and talk with the people, explain what I wanted to do. And, you know, the bottom line goals are to make connections, to be a, that sort of a bridge builder and to be an advocate for collaboration. Um, what I found during the campaign uh, season or the campaign portion of everything was something really incredible. I found myself sitting with tribal folks at the, maybe at the tribal administration office or in their homes and also visiting with non-tribal people, maybe from the farming community, and they're saying exactly the same things. We have the exact uh, concerns, wishes, and wants for our communities, for our young people, for, you know, life as a whole in South Dakota. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, there is, really isn't a lot of daylight between us all. Sure. And um, it, I think that element really led up to um, the election night. And I was sitting with um, some friends of mine, my son and others, and we were watching the election results come in. And, uh, you know, I handle stress pretty well, but boy, that was tough. And I thought, all of these politicians do this all the time. You're watching the numbers come in. And I started to think, I had people come up to me and say, hey, you're doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I really wanted was to not be embarrassed and, <laughs> and to, you know, have such a, a small turnout in numbers. And because uh, that was a possibility too. And as the numbers continued to climb, I had people come up and they were saying, "You know, I think you, I think you got this." Yeah. And then in the end, to see the numbers rise up to getting the most votes in this in our district really said something to me. That said that the tribal community was willing to get behind somebody that was going to work for them, work mm -hmm. hard for them, speak for them, and that uh, the non-tribal community within that area also. You know, it's my belief that uh, tribal or non-tribal within my district, we're a very diverse group uh, of people that, um, again, you know, they have the same wants for us too. We all want to succeed. Definitely. We're all in this together. Definitely. So that was a reflection, I think, in the numbers and the I, winning. I think that a lot of people just especially as Native, Native Americans or Native American citizens in South Dakota, we kind of look past the fact that you're Republican or so-and-so is, is Democrat, and we just see a relative out there doing good things, pushing, you know, uh, being a driving force for some of the things that we believe in, whether they're, so they, they kind of blur that, that line between Republicans and, and, and Democrats and conservatives and liberals, just knowing that, that you're out there advocating and doing things for us. And we'll get into some of your work here, but let's, let's take a quick break mm -hmm. and let's talk a little bit more about some of the things you're working on in the state here. We'll be back after a short break. Closed captioning for Oyate Today is brought to you by Black Hills Energy. Ready. 
Native Sun News has been voted the best weekly newspaper in its class for 2015 by the South Dakota and North Dakota Newspaper Associations. You can find a copy of the Native Sun News at many businesses and vending machines in Rapid City and the surrounding area and on all nine reservations. We publish every Wednesday so advertisers and subscribers can reach our diverse readership by calling 605-721-1266. The Native Sun News covers the other side of the story. You can't predict life's ups and downs. You just give it all you've got to stay on top. But it's easier with a partner like Security First Bank. Since 1898, we've been riding with you through the country's biggest ups and downs. And this is where we'll stay. Security First Bank. A relationship you can count on. Member FDIC. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I want to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas I need to eat 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 apples and bananas why can't I eat 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 apples and bananas Support the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks to help provide meals to those in need. Join us at feedingamerica.org. Hi, welcome back to Oyate Today. Once again, our guest tonight, well, our very special guest tonight, is Representative Tamara St. John. Thank you so much for being here, and uh, thank you for everything you're doing for, for us here in South Dakota. And uh, definitely, uh, I'm just very impressed, and I'm honored to have you here, so thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things, and you're a very passionate person, and, and I know, and I've just kind of been following you, not only through social media, but through through other media outlets, and I just know that you're a passionate person, and once you jump in, you jump all in, and, and that's a good thing for, for everybody. We all benefit from that. Um, one of the things that you uh, are most proud of in, in your time so far as a representative is sponsoring Bill, Senate Bill 164. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Right. Uh, Senate Bill 164 is for murdered and missing indigenous persons. Uh, the MMIW movement has been strong. Um, it's just incredible. It shows how something can be elevated up to a level where nationally, internationally, with our northern relatives, it has come to the surface and needs to be addressed. There's a, a whole lot to be done. Um, but it starts with Senate Bill 164. And in this last legislative session, we saw other legislators bring a couple of other bills that related to it, which brought testimony from people in this area, um, the people that actually work with this sort of an issue. And it was really amazing to me to see um, the, the, the journey of the bill. Um, it was a combined bill with the bills brought by uh, uh, Representative Poyer and Senator Foster. So the language in it was merged and uh, the testimony was uh, put together and it made it to the Senate floor. And I have to say that it was brought, uh, drafted and brought by Senator Lynn DeSanto, who has a nonprofit on, mis on uh, missing persons and anti-sex trafficking. So her work, uh, the idea that um, she saw as somebody that works with this issue that there needed to be a specific bill for indigenous women w said a lot to me. And so when we set out to um, get this passed, it took um, some lobbying, it took uh, answering questions, and those are questions that everybody has, like why is this happening? How bad is this? What are the numbers? And some of the answers to that are, are really tough. They're, they're hard to express in, uh, in its entirety. Uh, number one, our numbers um, we don't know, and that's a part of the problem. Um, the um, uh, Urban Indian Health 
has been working on this issue, and I think there's a lot of others like Sovereign Bodies Institute, um, Anita Lucchese, um, some of the people that are in the trenches in South Dakota. There's a lot of faces behind this that probably don't show, and I think about all of that when somebody's asking me about the bill. You know, my role is relatively small in bringing it forward, bringing it to the House, introducing it to the House, um, testifying in committee, and answering some of those questions as to why why this is needed and uh, the bigger question in the end uh, to see it pass unanimously in the Senate um, was an amazing day along with it came uh, the story of Savannah Gray Wend which I think we all know and from my own community and even from my own family um, Lakota Renville and her sure. story and so some of those things I think were really powerful and for the family that gave us permission to use her story in the passing of the bill to see her name be uh, read you know on the floor of the Senate was uh, really really powerful to know that she was important each and every one of them they're not forgotten uh, I can assure anybody that uh, all of those are thought of daily by their families and to see it on the House floor and when the vote came up and uh, of course that feeling of anxiety that you know what is this you know who's going to support this who isn't and uh, I looked up on the board and it was completely green wow that's and awesome. it just was just it, it just I I was literally I bet so it was pretty moved. emotional yeah Definitely. very much so um, let's talk a little bit about your work because I'm, I'm, I'm slowly learning about this just kind of you know, secondhand and, and, and such, but I want us to know a little bit more about the, the Tribal Tourism Alliance. I know that you've been a part of that and helping to promote that and push that. So what is that exactly and why is that important here? Well, tribal tourism, you know, we all know tourism mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of tourism is done without tribal input. And that's something that as Historic Preservation, the THPO offices and others, you know, we've been uh, the people that are on the front lines in protecting our cultural history and uh, telling our own story. And to me, tourism is an exercise in sovereignty where you're taking control of your cultural history, you're defining your own narrative, your own story, you're also determining what your tribe wants to show as far as tourism. What do you want the world to know? And in a world that's filled with stereotypes and misunderstandings and lack of communication, that's really important. And in the work with um, um, telling uh, the, the stories and dealing with issues like the massacre at Whitestone Hill, you know, I met people around that issue and within that community that didn't know us at all, didn't know our story, and I really thought that we were at odds. And um, the end result of education, communication, collaboration is uh, some of those individuals I consider very good friends. Mm -hmm. They embraced us, they embraced um, the Dakota story, um, the Native American story that's associated with the place, and they are allies forever on. So that's really the impact, I think, of engaging and telling our own story. And tourism is just a part of that. The other aspect of it is uh, very pro-economic development. One of the markers of success in tourism is putting dollars into the hands of your community, your tribal people. This was brought to me by individuals that work on a national level, um, some really strong partners um, such as IANTA, Federal Highways, um, many, many more. And uh, when I asked them, you know, why, why, what brought you to this? Why are you here in South Dakota, in North Dakota, with North Dakota Tribal Tourism Alliance? Why are you doing this? And they said, and specifically the individuals with George Washington University, and they are instrumental in educating people in tourism and creating people like me. I've been through their certification program and been certified in uh, tourism through them. And one of the things that they said was they were working internationally with tourism in impoverished communities. And it had occurred to them, we have impoverished communities in the United States. So how can we impact these communities? And some of the really pro 
pro um, positives within it are the protection of your cultural resources. Um, we get to define, you know, it's almost the reverse out there in American society that if something is special, hey, let's draw everybody there. You know, for us, a sacred place was something where we maybe visited um, once a year or we protected it and we don't elevate it to encourage people. You know, so things like within um, our tribal codes and uh, the burial sites are, are not a part of so tourism. So they're not going to be a part no, of the they are. promotions Every tribe for this. can decide. Yeah. You know, I, we, we individually as tribes get to decide what we wish to share and what we don't. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really taking control of it, and I think that's important. Yeah. So uh, Tribal Tourism Alliance has partnered with South Dakota State Tourism, and each of the tribal communities have their individuals, and we're just in the process of starting to build this alliance and form it. In North Dakota, it has progressed to a set board a uh, set board of directors and how each of the tribes with their documents that establish it. So we have the same work to do in South Dakota. That's awesome. Let's let's take a break. And we have some, well, I shouldn't say we, but you have some awesome events and some awesome things coming up in 2020. So let's take a break and we'll get to those. So we'll be back after a short break. from the Foundation for a Better Life. When discrimination happens in our community, and it does happen, then it's time to stand up and speak out to make it stop. Discrimination hurts and excludes. We can be better than that. People of Black Hills have a connection to each other, and none of us deserve discrimination. The Rapid City Human Relations Commission can help with discrimination issues in housing, employment, and public accommodations. And each of us, when we see it or hear it, can do our part to end discrimination. You have a responsibility to stand up and speak out. Sometimes, one moment changes everything. One song, one game, one mission. Support Make-A-Wish and help grant more life-changing wishes at wish.org. Hi, welcome back to Oyate Today. Once again, our guest tonight is Representative Tamara St. John. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you for the work you're doing. I'm just really glad to have you here and, and honored to, to be you. visiting with you tonight. So. Um, in 2020, you're going to be commemorating the women's right to vote. Tell me a little bit about this. 2020 is a big year for a lot of things, and that is one of them. The 100th uh, um, anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the women's right to vote. As a historian, I was very interested in this coming up, and it's been an honor to be appointed as one of the delegates by the governor to work on this uh, initiative, this project. And how it's going to uh, come out to the different communities, ideally different communities, will um, be recognizing this as a, a momentous part of history. Um, as a Native American woman legislator, when I'm sitting in um, on the the house uh, on the floor of the house and I think about that you know that a hundred years ago women were not even allowed to vote mm -hmm. and so you know having the unique distinction of being a Native American woman legislator you know I have and, and being a part of this initiative it's important that we note that for Native women the 19th Amendment really wasn't where we began to have a voice in politics. For us, it doesn't come until uh, the Citizenship, the citizenship Act. Um, and even then, in looking at the history, there were states that passed laws to prohibit 
natives from boating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have a very unique story. And as we proceed with some of these things and historical events, it is important. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it and share our unique history. Definitely. I appreciate that. Just think 100 years ago, your position, your role in, in the state didn't even exist. Right. And you weren't even a citizen. They would have never. I, there are times where I've sat on the floor, and I think I've shared that with you and a few others uh, when we had the opportunity to visit there, that there are times where I've sat there at my desk or maybe over in the Senate and thought, you know, this place would have never imagined me. In fact, years Senator later. Foster and I sat there and said those same things. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome. Now, also in 2020, we're going to be celebrating as a state the 30th anniversary of Native American Day, which was founded in 1990 and, and, and uh, kind of set a precedent for other states and other cities and other areas to kind of follow suit with Native American Day, American Indian Day, uh, Indigenous Peoples Days and, and, and such. Mm -hmm. And so... We're having our 30th anniversary commemoration here, and I understand you're going to have some very special events planned. And could you tell us a little bit about those, please? I am so excited about that. You know, as a historian in me, along, you know, as a legislator where history meets legislation in sort of a really unique and incredible way, the, the work, you know, my, my thought when we, you and I, first began to talk about um, this upcoming year, was to look at the original intention of Native American Day. I see all of the, the, the different uh, comments and ideas and things that get said on social media, and I really wanted to get back to um, you know, what was intended. And when I look at the history and I start to look at the articles, um, and certainly Mr. Gallego played a huge part in that, mm -hmm. and to see the, um, the, uh, the statements from Governor Mickelson and others, and to see the end result of that and how that impacted things like economic development for tribes, how that impacted things like even Black Hills Pow Wow. Um, this was a, a huge game changer in, in ways that maybe here now, my generation, the younger generation, that they don't realize. Mm -hmm. They think this has always been. We were on the forefront. We were the first to do this, mm -hmm. and what an incredible way. It's just a momentous thing. So I'm looking forward to um, doing a deep dive into that history, looking at those things, and sharing it with the rest of South Dakota. We make a good team. We're, we're we actually, are a and, great and team. I don't want to say that on camera, <laughs> but we are planning the parade and the presentations for that day. So I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you on that and uh, just everything that you're going to present on that day. So thank you so much for being you on bet. our show tonight. And just thank you for everything that you're doing for the state of South Dakota. Thank you. I want you. to thank our producers. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank Prairie Edge for hosting our show tonight. And I want to thank you for making Oyate Today a part of your night. Also, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Oyate Today, please visit oyatetoday.org. You've been watching Oyate Today, brought to you by Native Sun News Today. 